Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about Immortal Empires in Total War Warhammer 3. I want to talk about the most mediocre races in the game. Now to be clear, these are not bad races. They are races that have issues, be it bugs, issues with their army roster, issues with their economy, issues with their campaign plan, but these are not weak races. In fact, they have quite a few things going for them, but they also have a large number of issues that you will need to overcome if you do decide to play a campaign as any of these races, as any of their legendary lords. For some, more than others, and certainly some of these races do have really powerful legendary lords that can make a campaign pretty trivial uh, to deal with in a lot of ways. That doesn't mean they don't have issues to tackle. They do, uh, and that's going to hold them back. And number four, we have Norska. Now, Norska does have a good amount of strengths in terms of their army roster, but they also have quite a few issues that you'll have to deal with during the course of their campaign. The first issue actually has to do with their confederation mechanics. So on paper, it sounds great. Like, for instance, here, uh, here is a leader of another faction that Trog starts at war with. You ought to resolve this. This is on legendary very hard. And once you do defeat them, you get this post-battle option to either kill him or form a confederation. This can be a significant strength. For instance, as Strog, you gain up, uh, you gain free regions from the very start of your campaign, pretty much, with the, and you gain almost control of an entire province with the exception of the Winter Pyre, which is controlled by the Dwarves. So you're going to want to go to war against the Dwarves, or you already started war with the Dwarves, but you're going to want to take that out, take out the Dwarves. The problem with this particular mechanic comes down to the way Norskan factions view each other. Which Basically, they hate each other uh, very strongly. So here. they have an aversion of we'll minus 10 against each blood. other, which makes it very likely that they're going to end up in a war with one another. Now, the problem with this, beyond the obvious fact that you're going to have to plan a campaign around that and you're going to be attacked by other factions that you shouldn't necessarily be fighting, the issue is, it's very easy, if you know what you're doing as Norska, to gain control over all of Norska or significant portions of it from very early on in a campaign. You also don't have downsides when it comes to confederation. But here's the problem with this. Controlling all of Norska sounds great until you realize, shit, I just gained control of a vast expanse of territory that I ha now have to defend from other factions attacking. Especially since there's a lot of ports and it's very easy for other factions to attack across the sea. Now, the north should be relatively stable, unless Malice Darkblade decides to go on a killing frenzy. The north should be in a relatively stable uh, position. But the south, with the Empire, the Wood Elves, Kislev, that is a completely different story. And so you're going to have quite a bit of territory to defend against quite a few other factions that are going to seek to harass you, at the very least, during the course of a campaign, which makes it difficult to deal with everything. And even if you were a more powerful race than Norska currently is, ha having a lot of territory from the very start of your campaign is not necessarily the huge benefit that you might think it is, because it's money you have to spend on structures. It's territory that you have to defend. And it is almost inevitable if you're playing as Trog over here that the Varg and Wolfric even are both going to declare war on you fairly quickly in your campaign. Especially if you end up out resolving a lot of battles like I just did because you'll take quite a bit of casualties. And this brings me to the second point. Their units. Their issue with the units because they do have some major problems with the units as well. Okay, so the units of Norska, most of the Norskans, uh, Nor actual Norskans themselves can be relatively weak. Like the regular Norskan Marauders, pretty pathetic. There are some good units like Berserkers, Champions, those can be pretty good. But one of the things to mention about a lot of Norskan units is that the armor they have, being Norskan Trolls, uh, even Berserkers, which are certainly good units with high leadership, good melee stats, they have low armor. The reason this matters is that it means in a lot of unresolved situations, you're going to take very significant casualties during the course of your campaign. And to actually uh, get casualty replenishment, by the way, you need to get a Femir Balefanged, which is a tier 4 unit. Not exactly fun to do so. So you may have issues early on when it comes to casualty replenishment in your campaign. Sure, Trog starts with one. 
I don't believe Wolfric uh, actually starts with one. He doesn't start with one. So this is the reason why Trog is the better choice than Wolfric. Because, yeah, Trog has a, the ability to gain a province with four regions very quickly. Wolfric, poor Wolfric, he only gets one with two regions. And then he has to fight another um, a Norsecon faction for the Doomkeep. Which is not going to give him a major economic benefit. Because it doesn't have ports. But when we're talking about units, the low armor on a lot of Norsecon units can be a major issue. It means uh, you're going to have to fight a lot of battles manually that you will win relatively easily. And it also means that even if you can win it to not resolve, you may not want to do so. Because the way the AI works in this game is if it perceives you being weak, then it will go through you. You taking a lot of casualties and battles just incentivizes the AI to go to war against you. So that pushes you, at least in the early game, to fight a lot of these battles manually so that other Norsecon factions don't declare war on you too quickly. It is not exactly a pleasant experience fighting battles that you know for certain you're going to win with relative ease. In fact, there are certain situations in the campaign where you might want to resolve just to avoid that really annoying battle that goes for sieges. Another problem with units is the cost. Norska doesn't exactly have the best economy in the world. Yes, their ports can generate a lot of money, but their regular settlements do not, though thankfully they can trade. But the regular settlements can only generate up to 150. That is pretty pathetic, actually. And this is by design. Creative Assembly did nerf their regular economy by design because they wanted to focus Norska on naval supremacy. All well and good but it has certainly created issues in their campaign. I mean, they're a good race, but they've never been a top-tier race, and Creative Assembly nerfing them was not exactly a welcome change. So their units can take a lot of damage, and they're expensive units as well. It's not like these guys are cheap. Regular Marauders might only cost 400, but their upkeep is 100. Trolls, if we're looking at Trolls, and keep in mind, Trog has a 20% upkeep benefit to Trolls. Trolls, Norse Controls, uh, Norse con Ice Trolls or Norse Controls, they're still uh, 190 or 160. Berserkers, if we're looking at the unit roster, Berserkers are 188. Yes, you do have an upkeep benefit if you're playing as Wolfric, but they're still expensive units to actually use during uh, the course of your, uh, your campaign. Um, and they... There are factions that have many cost, more cost-effective units than you do. Having expensive units just slows down your campaign progress by quite a significant amount. So those are the problems with units. Then we go further, because there's two other issues that Norska does have. The first one is the god system, the various... Um, uh, gods that you can gain favor uh, f uh, for. So Nurgle, uh, for instance, over here, Tsinge, uh, Tsinge over here, uh, Korn, or, um, um, <clears throat> or rather, sorry, not the, that, that's Slaanesh, isn't it? Yeah, that is uh, Slaanesh. Um, and Tsinge over here. Now, these benefits are fairly substantial, like at level one, at level two, rather. At level one, you can get either upkeep benefit, uh, casualty replenishment, weapon strength, or um, or when, or research rate. Very substantial benefits and a 20% income from ports with all of them. I would say the Serpent's Gaze is probably the best one for a minus 10% upkeep. But here's the problem. The way you gain favor with a god is you need to raise a settlement for that particular god. That will get, grant you some favor. The problem is that, one, if you raise a settlement, then you'll have to take it over and spend money on it. And two, if you do raise it, you're not going to gain the money from sacking it. So you're always going to have this balancing act if you're playing as Norska between raising settlements or just sacking them and taking them. Because you want the money from sacking them. It's not like you're going to be swimming in money. Otherwise, you need the income from sacking. It's, your economy is built on, around the idea that you gain a lot of money from sacking, but this interferes with your ability to gain favor with the gods. So it is an issue, a major problem during the course of your campaign, having to balance this out, and it makes you weaker as a faction and it limits your growth. Because having to to deal with that means that you're just going to expand sl more slowly, your economy is going to be weaker. You do want the benefits, there are substantial benefits, but also you want the income from sacking settlements. And finally, we have one of the core mechanics of Norska, which are the monster hunts. Now, here's the problem with the monster hunts. The way you get them is through research nothing too complicated there nothing broken there 
But the objectives that you need to do in order to achieve success, those are bugged. So for instance, I was doing a monster hunt as a in a campaign as Trog, and the objective was to raid Middenheim. Okay, I thought to myself, all right, I'll, ju I'll, I'll just sack Middenheim, then take it over, and then raid it, right? Um, I didn't want to switch to the raiding stance at that turn. So I took it, and then the objective failed. This is something that has been happening in Warhammer 3 since it came out. One major and infamous example was with Tyrion not being able to get one of his crucial quest items because the quest itself forced him to take over the Phoenix Gate. The thing is, Alariel has the tendency of beating you to it. In fact, if you're playing pretty much any campaign as Tyrion, there's very little chance that you're going to get to the Phoenix Gate before Alariel does. Never mind the fact that the quest in, qu in question was not something that triggered automatically uh, or at a very low level. It, you require a decent level of Tyrion to actually get it in the first place. So not getting that item was a major issue. It's a similar problem with the quest objectives for the monster hunts for Norska. And you want to do these monster hunts. You want to do them, but they're bugged. In fact, they're so bugged, I would say that playing a Norska campaign right now is probably not worth it because of the bugs that these monster hunts do have. I'm not sure if there is a mod that fixes it. Maybe there is. Hopefully there is. But with the monster hunt uh, hunts bug, that is a major downside for playing with Norska at the moment. And it's one of the big things that needs to be fixed. So you do have... You do have a powerful army, like Norskan Ice Trolls and Norskan Trolls will punch way above their weight when it comes to battles. Like, they'll take very powerful armies on their own. They have fear, uh, they can cause uh, fear, they have a good amount of physical resistance. They can take a hit when it comes to a battle. But the issue is, the, the problem is the significant cost of a lot of the units, the low armor on a lot of the units, the annoyance with the various gods' favor, as well as the annoying situation with monster hunts, which are just flat out bugged. And number three, we have the Tomb Kings. Now, the Tomb Kings are a race that does have a good amount of power in their campaign, if you build up to it. But it's the building up to it part that's really the problem in every single one of their campaigns, with the exception of Ark in the Black. See, if you're playing a Tomb King Legendary Lord, you're only going to be able to start with one army. And that means, regardless of what units you're throwing in the army, you have a far more limited amount of campaign flexibility. Now to unlock a second army, you do have three choices. You can either increase it to a research, so it takes 14, 15 turns to get a second dynasty, and then that's gonna slow down all research by 30% and this stacks, or you can increase it for the mortuary cult for a lot of money and a lot of canopic jars. Or you can get one of the books of Nagash that will give you uh, army capacity. The one uh, that does so is the fifth book of Nagash, which gives you unit capacity for certain units and one army capacity. It's the best book in the entire game. I'll talk about the books in just a second. Though. So your early game is going to feel very limited, especially dependent on some of the start positions that you do have. Now Arkan over here, he overcomes this because he starts with one extra army capacity and he also doesn't have the same kind of unit limits that other actions do have because he does have a special structure that allows him to get uh, Crypt Goals, Direwolves, and Felbats early on in his campaign. But he is exception, he is not the role. And he is the most powerful Legendary Lord of the Tomb Kings because of that, because he has that much easier early game. But if you're playing as Cetra, as Kalida, as Katep, you do have that very significant limitation in your campaign. And that is a problem because only having one army means it's difficult to take territory. It's more difficult to take territory. If you're playing on a high difficulty, you're generally going to encounter full stacks from the enemy, let alone the full stacks and garrison. So you're going to have some very early game fights. But there's more to it. One of the main ways to increase army capacity or hero capacity is through canopic jars. Yes, you have the research, but even the research may require canopic jars. But here's the problem with canopic jars in a campaign as the Tomb Kings. There's only two major ways of getting them consistently. One, you fight the battle, and in the aftermath of the battle, you choose to harvest the organ organs for 30 canopic jars. Or, you take a settlement, 
And when you take this element, you don't sack it, you don't raise it. When you take a settlement, you just occupy it. I mean, you could raise it, but you generally don't want to. As Tomb Kings, you want to hold on to a lot of territory. Um, and you just occupy it for 30 more. In this case. So you can gain uh, 60 Canopic Jars, but it's never going to increase. It's not like money or some other, uh, like food for Skaven. Because you can gain more food with Skaven or meat with Ogres, depending on the size of the army you're fighting. Or the settlement that you're dealing with. For Tomb Kings, it is a fixed amount. But increasing the capacity over here isn't a fixed amount. It goes higher the more you do it. So it is a major problem in the campaign. And here's the thing. A lot of good, uh, like quite a few things, like the banners over here, where if you get them, all of them, you can get the Heralds Empowered, which gives you an extra army capacity and global recruitment duration and capacity. All of this requires um, Canopic Jars. Uh, like getting a Lich Priest over here requires Canopic Jars. Some of the research, like at the top, requires Canopic Jars. We're talking here hundreds of thousands for the course of a campaign and you can only gain 30 from either a battle or by just taking a settlement and of course you're going to miss out on the money that you could gain by sacking a settlement because if you sack it and then take it you're not going to get those canopic jars so those are some major issues that the tomb kings have to deal with in their campaign and the problem here is yes they are a powerful race yes they have a lot of late game potential and yes they can steamroll the late game like no one else can the reason they can steamroll the game is because their unit recruitment is for free so once you've built up a massive empire and you can just recruit a lot of units since you've increased the capacity you don't really care about your armies your armies are perfectly disposable because you're not paying money for them you're not paying for upkeep you're not paying to recruit them so if you lose an army, the only thing that actually has value in that army that you would lose permanently are the heroes. And that's only until you get immortal for those heroes in the campaign. The lords, any lord, the regular lords, start with immortal. So you're never at risk of losing them, except tempor uh, temporarily. So once you get a massive empire and start building uh, a lot of armies and a lot of units, you're unstoppable flat out unstoppable but the early game is a nightmare and I, honestly i think this kind of campaign style which is an issue in general in total war where the early game is really difficult but the mid to late game are pathetically easy is something that makes a lot of campaigns boring to be quite honest i think that a much better campaign is one where you have scaling difficulty where the early game might be easy but then it starts getting more and more difficult but that's not the case in a lot of total war campaigns and i think the tomb kings in general are one of the worst examples of this because their early game with the exception of Arkhan who has a very easy early game as well but with the exception of Arkhan all the early game uh, situation for the Tomb Kings is pretty hard and then gets easier now another thing uh, for the Tomb Kings it's their diplomacy with other Tomb Kings as well because you might have good relations like if you're starting etc you might have good relations with the dynasty over here but you can't confederate other lords and the problem is you actually want this territory for yourself you want all of Camry for yourself and it's because of the special structures that are there uh, that give you uh, these um, unique buildings and the pyramids so you have a lot of pyramids in Camry and you need those you don't need them just for the effects they give you though those are pretty substantial but you also need them in order to achieve your long campaign victory condition as you might imagine, this basically forces it, you, if you're playing as any of the Tomb King Legendary Lord, to wipe out every other Tomb King faction in the game. It doesn't matter if you're Setra, Arkhan, Kalida, or Katep, you're going to have to wipe out the others. It's especially ridiculous for Katep for him to wipe out Setra in his campaign. It's also especially ridiculous for Katep to actually have to make his way over here, though he can do so, though his... Uh, some people have said the real journey of Katep's campaign is to invade Camry from the east, like you take a sea lane and uh, make your way to, uh, to Camry from the east. It isn't a great campaign in a lot of ways, that one, but it is a journey at least. But the problem, in, when it comes down to it, the issue is you're just going to kill every other faction of the same race that you are. That's not exactly a great uh, campaign situation. And then finally, we have the Books of Nagash themselves, 
which are randomized. So if you're starting a Tomb King campaign, one of the best things you can do is make sure you have like the fifth book of Nagash close to you, as well as, uh, so you have the fifth book of Nagash close to you, as well as having, I believe it's the fourth book for the Lord Recruit rank. You can also benefit, of course, from the seventh book for the 10 canopic jars generated per turn. Another way to generate canopic jars is to get a skill uh, from heroes and lords that give you a couple of canopic jars, like up to three per turn. But getting, and it can be a, quite a bit once you got a lot of lords and heroes, but it's going to take a long time to do so. And you're wasting skill points on something that just kind of feels uh, pointless in a lot of ways, because it's very, very little per hero and you're missing out on other vital skills. But here's the issue of the books of Nagash. Beyond the fact that their location is randomized, as well as where some of these books are, because there's like one in Ulfwan. So let me invade Ulfwan, which is by the, the Safari is going to be held by Tyrion in the vast majority of campaigns. Let me invade Ulfwan, pick a fight with one of the most powerful factions in the game, just to get a bloody book. Not exactly a fun situation. And it's not like you can get these books that are in certain elements. You can't get these from diplomacy. See, the thing is, Forek Ironbrow has a similar situation in his campaign, but he can at least get the relics he needs via diplomacy, military, a military alliance. If you're playing as the Tomb Kings, I believe you can't, so you actually have to take those elements yourself. I mean, Forek has already enough issues in his campaign, even with that particular situation. You, however, if you're playing as a Tomb King Legendary Lord, you're going to have to declare war on a faction that holds that settlement and take it over. Or you have to defeat some very powerful rogue armies in your campaign. Like this guy over here, he is pretty bloody powerful because he has a combination of lizard units and uh, wood elven units. It is an absolute nightmare of a fight to pick with this fellow right here. So yeah, the books are pretty broken, the canopic jars are pretty bo the broken, the limitations in the early game are pretty frustrating to deal with, and it just leads itself to being an overall mediocre race. They have power in the mid late game if you can overcome the early game, but that early game, with the exception of Ark and the Black, can be genuine misery to deal with. And number two, we have the Lizardmen. Now, don't get me wrong, there can be some really fun campaigns as the Lizardmen and powerful campaigns as the Lizardmen, but the underlying race is a fairly mediocre one. If you want to play a good Lizardmen campaign, play Oxyatl, because he has a lot of power, and it is one of the more fun campaigns in the game. But the generic Lizardmen playstyle isn't necessarily that fun. They do have a decent amount of power, specifically because of their focus on heavy infantry and monstrous units and monstrous, monstrous infantry units, they do have a good deal of power during the course of their campaigns. The problem is, well, there's two major issues. And while it's only two issues, they are actually substantial enough issues to put them on this list. The ranking that they got is because this is how people voted on them. So the Lizardmen do have power, but the problem is this. One, their units are actually pretty expensive to recruit and crucially to maintain. So regular Saurus, which are not necessarily that much better than other cheaper units, but they're pretty effective, high leadership, good melee stats, uh, decent armor. Uh, Saurus are 750 to recruit, 188 to maintain. Even regular skanks are still 100 upkeep, uh, the skank cohort, the ones with javelins. They're still pretty expensive. So Saurus... And every Lizardman unit can be pretty expensive to maintain during the course of your campaign. That is an issue because even though you have a pretty good economy, uh, and your main economic building generates by default 200, going all the way to 400, although you do have a pretty decent economy, it isn't good enough for the huge unit costs that you're going to be dealing with as the Lizardman. So that is one of the bigger problems, just the limitation when it comes to the number of armies that you can maintain at playing as a Lizardman Legendary Lord because of the costs of even some of your basic units. And when it comes to Saurus, by the way, or Dinosaurs, you don't want regular Saurus. What you want are Saurus with shields, eventually Temple Guard, which is annoying about Temple Guard because you're going to need to get another structure, uh, you're going to need to get the structure to be able to uh, recruit them as well as some other units that can be annoying. Hero capacity obviously is also going to require TR4 in order to increase hero capacity. 
but that's uh, but that's the norm really for a lot of races. Now the lizardmen do have a pretty decent army when it comes to their combat ability, but one of the things I would note about them is their casualty replenishment by default is actually fairly weak. You can, however, overcome it with a hero, but just the baseline casualty replenishment feels weaker than actually quite a lot of other races that do exist in the game at the moment. Um, and that is a problem because the only way to get a higher casualty replenishment is to get the Skink Chief, but to increase the capacity of Skink Chiefs, you need the tier 4 structure. So, uh, quite a few of your armies, even if you have them, they might take a while to recover from the battles you're fighting because you're just not going to have that casualty uh, replenishment. And I'm not quite entirely certain if a Skink Chief is a DLC unit or not. I know the Chameleon uh, units are, but I'm not sure about the Skink Chief, uh, to be quite honest. I believe it could be a DLC unit, but I'm not entirely uh, certain on that. If it is a DLC unit, that is a pretty major issue. Uh, or if it's a DLC hero, that can be a pretty major issue, but I don't necessarily believe that is. I think um, the DLC unit for uh, the, uh, the DLC hero for the uh, uh, sk uh, skinks are the skink uh, priests, actually. Uh, or the skink or oracle, rather. I apologize for that. So that can be a pretty big problem when your casualty replenishment is so heavily tied to a particular hero. Like, Kisav has good casualty replenishment by default baseline, Whereas for you, it can be a bit slower. I think it's because um, individual units have a lot of HP, sure. And it, it they the Lizardmen generally have fewer models than some other races. And they have a lot of HP, so it just takes longer to replenish that kind of level of HP. As opposed to races that have a lot of models in units, but lower HP. So it's easier, it's faster to replenish that kind of HP. So this is... One of the problems that the lizard that you're gonna have to deal with if you're playing the lizardman, like if you're playing as Maz Mundi here, which honestly Maz Mundi has a worse lizardman campaign, one of the things you would want to do is start getting that skink chief very very quickly unlocked during the course of your campaign. That is one of the main limitations of um, of the lizardman: their casualty replenishment and expensive units. But there's more. And this is something that also drags them down. Their research. Their research, which requires certain buildings in order to unlock. This is generally not, not fun. Now, some of this research you would not bother unless you're getting those per uh, particular units. Fair enough. But having to get the sacred spawning chambers can be, you know, pretty annoying um, when it comes to some to just being able to start getting the t first tier of research just for Saurus units. That can be pretty annoying, but even further, like the Scrying Pool, which is a structure you would generally not bother with, because yeah, 5% research sounds decent, but there's other things you could do with those building slots, like econom uh, economy, growth, control, all that kind of stuff, hero capacity. So just spending a, a, a structure slot just for a particular uh, research or to unlock research can feel pretty frustrating. It is an issue the High Elves have, but here's the thing. The High Elves are substantially stronger than uh, than the Lizardmen. Like, the Skaven also have the same issue. Some other races have it, where you need certain structures to unlock uh, research. But the thing for a lot of racers, with the exception of one particular structure for the High Elves, is most of the structures you would get, you'd get them naturally. For the Lizardmen, quite a few of the structures to unlock research are not necessarily things you would usually bother. Like Skaven have even their entire research tree locked off unless you get buildings, but the buildings you're getting at Skaven are buildings you would get regardless. And even for the High Elves, it doesn't matter as much because Baseline High Elves are a much stronger and powerful faction than the Lizardmen could even dream of. And it's only for a certain specific research that uh, you need those structures for, anyway. So, a uh, pretty big difference between uh, the two of them. And just having to get those buildings, in general, it is an annoying factor to do so. It is pre, it can be pretty uh, annoying, like, you know, getting a star cha a chamber for determining the great plan, technology, all that kind of stuff. It just feels like you're wasting your time with some of these structures. I mean, the scrying pool in particular feels wor worthless. The star chamber, a bit of a different discussion, of course, because of the recruit rank for slan, faction-wide, and hero recruit rank. Yeah, that can be worth it. But again, just annoying to have to deal with uh, the situation and races that don't have technology limited by structures are 
generally stronger for it. You are. You're limited by the unit cost. You're limited by the, the research tree. You're limited be, uh, by your casualty replenishment. That's the issue with the Lizardmen. That said, I do emphasize, like I did at the start of this video, that none of the races on this list are necessarily weak. They just have these issues that you're going to need to overcome in your campaign. I'd say the only thing that's actually broken about any of these races is just that Norsk and Mount, uh, Monster Hunt uh, situation. It's not... And the thing is, I believe you need to actually achieve those Monster Hunts in order to win the campaign. So, having those broken, pretty substantial issue in that particular campaign. But with the exception of that... These races are playable, they just can be very frustrating. But they do have legendary lords that do make their races really good, like Oxyatl, Gorok, for instance, Tic-Tac-Toe even. Finally, and number one, as the most mediocre race in Total War Warhammer 3, we have Fair Bretonia. Bretonia is a race that does have a good amount of power behind it, but also has some very significant downsides. What are the benefits of Bretonia? They have flat out one of the best cavalry arms in the entire game, if not the best uh, cavalry arm in the game. The downside of the cavalry is that cavalry is pretty weak when it comes to siege battles. And guess what? You're going to have a lot of those if you're playing a Bretonian campaign, especially in Bretonia, like Leon, uh, Luan, Leon Kerr, or as the Fey Enchantress way over here, because there's a lot of provincial capitals, so you're going to have a lot of siege battles to tackle, for which your army of heavy knights is, is poorly suited. The knights are ideally suited in an open field battle, but poorly suited in, uh, in, in siege battles. You do have some options when it comes to that, but you are a really weak faction when it comes to laying siege which is a significant problem that will impede a lot of your campaign progress. It's not something to make light of, it is a major downside of playing Bretonia. Beyond that, when it comes to Bretonia, they do have some very substantial benefits uh, when it comes to their campaign situation. So, just to uh, author, uh, just to deal with, uh, with those battles uh, right here and take this particular settlement, if I take over this uh, specific settlement, one of the things that should be about uh, Bretonia is they have really good control over their territory. Plus 10 control with commandment. Now, it is a commandment, so you need an entire province to make use of it. But it is a sub such a substantial level of control that you will flat out never face rebellions if you're playing as Bretonia. On top of that, your economy can be really, really good. You have good growth, you have good... Um, uh, and you have good economic output. Though a lot of your economy may be tied to structures uh, together. So for instance, if you want to get the fields to tier 2, then of course you need a windmill to tier 3, you need a water wheel, all that. And it's going to exclude the indus industrial buildings, which can be a bit annoying to deal with. But the economy certainly is there. The growth of the faction is there as well. So you do have... Uh, you do also have really good growth from your structures, like even a minor settlement will give you up to 60 growth. That is probably one of the highest in the game, actually, just by default. Like, greenskins can have better, but greenskins have it better because of commandments and because of the wall mechanic. You have it better just because your baseline settlement buildings just provide it. That is a substantial amount of economic power and campaign power just because you have that really good growth. Here's the downside economically, the peasant economy. So the way this works is you have a capacity of peasants dependent on how many regions you control. The more regions you have, the more peasants you can recruit. Peasants are basically all the non-cavalry units. This includes siege equipment. So if you go over this, you will lose that minus 10% upkeep for non ninth units and your economy is going to start to degrade. So if you go over this, you're going to suffer a lot of a lot of issues so you need to maintain a huge amount of territory to have a lot of peasants now by default this can be a bit of an issue and it will be a major issue in your campaign for the early game until you get a particular piece of research that research is the water pumps which gives you an extra peasant unit for every region and after you get that research which yeah it does take 30 turns but once you get that research you're never really going to have uh, issues with the peasants but the fact you have to spend 30 turns to get rid of this problem is suffice it to say annoying and it's not like you're getting rid of it completely or just making it far less of an issue to deal with 
and you do want the fields. The thing is, this generally will affect the fields, but you want the fields because you want to recruit the peasant archers from them. So you don't want to focus on industry, you want to focus at least to a certain degree on peasant peasants because you want the peasant bowmen with fire arrows and pox arrows in your campaign because they're your only infantry ranged option and you actually will want to get these for siege battles in particular and even open field battles because your infantry line is pretty pathetic until foot squires which are a tier 4 unit not the tier 3 unit a tier 4 unit that is weaker in a lot of respects to many tier 2 units Take these guys against Warriors of Chaos or Armored Kossars or Jade Warriors. Yeah, J Tier 2 units may win or give them a run for their money. They do have some benefits, of course, but they're also uh, expensive. Then they're all they're the only infantry option that's actually worth using as Bretonia. The other ones, not so much. Between recruiting an archer unit and a peasant unit, both of which will, which will affect your peasant economy, it is better to uh, recruit an archer unit. Or an artillery unit. Because Bretonia does have a very substantial benefit. It's far bigger than people may realize when they're just looking at faction benefits. The one major benefit of Bretonia is they can get artillery at tier 2. This is gigantic as a benefit. It's gigantic because your main issue is actually taking settlements. And in fact, for a lot of factions, the main issue they're going to have in their campaign is to take settlements. You have the ability to break down walls, so you get more maneuverability in the settlements. It still doesn't make your cavalry army good in settlement battles, to be very, very clear on this, but it at least gives you more flexibility, because if you had to knock down the gates and rush your army through the gates, they would just get slaughtered. The fact you have that kind of flexibility in your campaign is, uh, is a huge benefit. Uh, there are other factions that have this. The Greenskins have it with trolls, the ability to break down gates at least, and having trolls really being really good in siege battles. The Dwarves have Grudge Rowers at tier 2. So there are other factions that have this benefit, but but trebuchets are really good um, artillery units. Having it at tier 2 as opposed to the tier 4 of the Empire gives you a lot of campaign strength. And it's not like Bretonia doesn't have some good melee units, it's just not from this particular... Uh, building line you just want to get rid of this quickly as possible instead your good melee units can be found through the grail chapel specifically the battle pilgrims that's where you get some really good uh, infantry uh, some really good infantry units because you look at battle pilgrims they have better melee stats they have decent armor good leadership and they have frenzy you want to talk about good melee units for in the game Battle Pil Pilgrims are it. They're also really cheap as well when we're looking at them. They have a lot of combat effectiveness. They're cheap, They only, but they do need a tier 3 sound. But they're better than any other unit you have in, in terms of infantry in your roster, including, I would argue, the Foot Squires. Yes, the Foot Squires have more armor. Battle Pil Pilgrims, when you look at them, they have a bronze shield, so they're able to take more range damage than other units. So there are some benefits with Bretonia. That's why this is a mediocre faction list, not a bad faction list. There are benefits. They have casualty replenishment for, from damsels, all that stuff. Then they have the chivalry system. One of the things I would say if you're playing a Bretonian campaign, don't care about losing chivalry because you sack settlements or because you choose the post-battle option to ransom enemies. You can get some negative traits, but you can remove them. And hell, one of the negative traits is one you actually want because it gives you more income up to 50%, I believe, income from sacking settlements, which can give you a significant amount of money. Money is not an issue if you're playing Bretonia, thank thankfully. It's actually one of the few things you do have going during the course of your campaign. One of the very, very few things, actually. Um, but there are certainly problems uh, to deal with because of the heavy cavalry playstyle. And speaking about the heavy cavalry playstyle, let's talk about this because there are going to be some major issues when it comes down to the heavy cavalry playstyle. And of course, we're talking here about the vows. Damsels don't uh, don't have them, so damsels as heroes can get immortal uh, uh, regularly. But if you are, let's say, if you recruit a prophetess, right? If you recruit a prophetess for some magical ability, you're going to need to get the frauds over here. And unlocking the vows for your lords your regular lords or for your paladin heroes unlocking immortality so they don't die if you lose a battle 
and then say get wounded requires you to get these three vows. Now getting these vows can be really annoying. In particular, um, the second one especially can be annoying because it either requires you to fight the jungle battle or sea battle, which can be a bit of an issue, or to defeat a legendary lord of certain races. Pre can be some issues unlock or yeah, just can be really annoying to unlock some of these vows during the course of the campaign, and you have to do it with every single paladin hero and every single lord. And you might even have to do it on your legendary... Uh, you will actually have to do it on every legendary lord, with the exception of Lu and Leon Kerr. I mean, to be fair, Rapunz does start with the questing vow unlock, so she only has to get the grail vow, so it's not too big of an issue, but having to manage that for every hero, every paladin, and every uh, regular lord can be annoying. But you do need to manage it for the regular lords, at least the knight's vow, because, and maybe even the questing vow. The reason you need to do it is because these knight units, they are pretty expensive even with it unlocked. But the, one of the effects of these vows for lords is greatly reducing uh, the upkeep of these, uh, these knight uh, units. So without it, you would be looking at a major upkeep cost for uh, for any kind of knight uh, unit that you do King recruit Lord. during the course of your campaign. There lies the problem, one of the major issues that Bretonia has, that yes, they can have a good economy, a really good economy, and can have a lot of armies, but they're limited by the peasant economy and the number of units they can have, because that peasant economy is going to affect your trebuchets, it's going to affect your archers, it's going to affect your entire infantry line. And they're limited in the knights they can have because they can be flat out too expensive to maintain even if you have the vows, let alone if you don't have the vows unlocked in the campaign. Therein lies the problem. And their playstyle is not ideally suited for the settlement hopping campaign that you do have in Warhammer 3. Bretonia itself has a lot of regions that have provincial capitals that you need to besiege. Now, if you can take them, this is greatly beneficial because Bretonia, out of all the factions of the game, actually does want provincial capitals because they want to get uh, structures to tier like four, like the, or even tier five, because that's how they increase their hero. Uh, that's how they get access to some of their best units or some major campaign benefits. Sure, fair enough. But actually, taking all these elements can be a bit of a nightmare. Now, granted, they're held by Bretonian factions, but here's another issue. You can't confederate by default unless you're playing Rapunz. You can't confederate with other Bretonian factions unless you do research, the Chivalric Code specifically. And this will give you an opportunity to confederate with another faction through an event where you either spend money or chivalry, or you just let them be and confederate them regularly. And you don't have downsides for confederating as Bretonia, which is... Actually, you have a benefit, a temporary control benefit when you confederate with another faction as Bretonia. Um, but it can be pretty annoying. And much of this research, by the way, is pretty pointless because, just to give you an idea, in this campaign, like as Lewin, Paravan is going to be wiped out very quickly. Aquitaine is going to be wiped out very quickly. Bastan is going to be wiped out very quickly. Artois is going to be wiped out very quickly. So much of the research that you have here is just pointless. Bretonia is a free DLC faction, and it's yeah, always and felt Leon like Kerr. that. It's always felt incomplete. It's always felt like it had issues, because it's with the paid DLCs that Creative Assembly really puts in effort into trying and improving a race. Like, with the Grom the Paunch DLC, they made the Greenskins from one of the most pathetic factions in the game to one of, flat out, the most powerful factions. Bretonia being a free DLC faction all, and always being a, a free DLC faction has always limited their potential. They do have it, to be clear. In open field battles, they are one of the better factions in the game. In sieges, they are one of the worst factions in the game. That's the problem. Economically, they're good, but they do have the limit of the peasant economy. And they will have, they will always have to deal with the limits of either not having vows on lords and thus struggling to get more armies, or um, or the issue of the peasant economy for peasant units. So there's a lot of trade-offs that come from playing a Bretonian campaign. The power is there, to be clear on this. The power that this faction does have is there, but is also severely limited by a number of annoying campaign 
mechanics that you have to deal with. Now, thankfully, chivalry is not really an issue you care about anymore in your campaign because, oh, you know, you release the captive or you ransom the captives. You don't care because, you know, I just got 40 chivalry by winning those battles. So chivalry is not going to be an issue. You're easily going to be able to get a lot of chivalry in your campaign. Sure, fair enough. And you can even get, if you have a very high amount of chivalry, you can get the Knight's Vow and then the Questing Vow. But the thing is, when you're at this kind of level of chivalry, you've pretty much won the campaign. So yeah, it's nice that you may get the Knight's Vow eventually and the Questing Vow, but by that point, it kind of doesn't matter in a lot of ways for your campaign. That's all there is to say. Costine here, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and I'll see you boys and girls next time. If you do enjoy my content, consider supporting me via PayPal or Patreon. I would greatly appreciate your donations.